Last month, Fujifilm sent me their X-T5 to test out for a few weeks. I've been really enjoying the X100F, and it got me wondering, how good are their newer cameras? Before the X100F, I never tried a Fujifilm, so I was always curious about these cameras. Were they as good as everyone says they are? And can I really just use film recipes and never have to edit my photos ever again? Okay, so I've had the Fujifilm X-T5 for about a month now, and although there were many times where I got really frustrated and annoyed with this camera, I have been enjoying it, and I love the photos that I have gotten out of this camera. Now this isn't gonna be a technical review. I'm sure Gerald Undone already has a video for this camera, so if that's what you're looking for, this video isn't it. I wanna mostly talk about my experience using the X-T5 for the past month, what I like about it, what I don't like about it, what I recommend it, and yeah, my overall experience with it. So first things first, what is APS-C? Well, APS-C is essentially just the size of sensor that the camera is using. So this is an APS-C sensor, just like full frame will have a bigger sensor. Then there's micro four thirds and there's medium format. These are all just different size of sensors. Having a smaller sensor has its perks, but it also has it's con. So if you are shooting on an APS-C, you'll notice that APS-Cs are pretty light. They're also more affordable. The lenses are more affordable and they're a lot smaller and a more compact kit, even with a lens on it, than something like a full frame camera which makes APS-C cameras really good for anybody who does a lot of traveling or a photographer who doesn't wanna carry a big kit with them all the time. However, APS-C does have its downsides when compared to something like full frame. Full frame is gonna perform better in low light and we'll talk about that a little later on. It's also typically sharper and higher quality than APS-C sensors. However, APS-C is getting better now and I honestly don't see the difference. And depending on the situation, if you're using the same equivalent lens, full frame will have a better or shallower depth of field than APS-C. I actually made a video talking about the differences and comparing APS-C and full frame. So if you wanna go check out that video, it'll be linked somewhere up here. With the Fujifilm X-T5, I struggled to understand whether or not this was a photo first camera, a video first camera, or a hybrid camera. On the photo side, it has great specs. It has Fuji's latest X-Trans 5 40 megapixel sensor, up to 20 frames per second continuous shooting, eye subject auto focus detection, subject detection for animals, birds, cars, motorcycles, bikes, planes, trains, basically everything. Has dual SD card slots, has excellent resolution when it comes to the viewfinder and the LCD screen. Has a maximum shutter speed of one over 180,000 on the electronic shutter, which caught me by surprise because if you're shooting midday on a very bright day, you wanna keep your ISO as low as possible and your aperture as wide open as possible. And you're shooting in something like aperture priority. So you won't need an ND filter if you're shooting on those bright sunny days. It has other features like being able to create a 160 megapixel photo using pixel shifting. And just like all Fuji films, it has the ability to create film recipes using the built-in film simulation. So it has a bunch of great photo specs. On the video side, it has more great specs. It can shoot in 6.2K up to 30 frames per second, 4K up to 60 frames per second, great in-body image stabilization. It can shoot in F-Log2, 10-bit 422, in either H.264 or H.265. It can even output 6.2K RAW with an external recorder. And you know what, I actually forgot to test out whether or not it has a crop when shooting in any of these video modes. So give me one second. Switch it into movie. So we're in 4K 23, no crop. Kick it up to 60 frames per second. It looks like it crops very slightly. So if you're shooting in 4K 20, there's no crop. You shoot in 4K 60, it does crop, but I don't even think it's a 1.5 times crop. It's very 
very subtle. I'm gonna switch it into 6.2K. 23 frames per second. And yeah, there's a crop on it. I don't know how much exactly if these crops are. The one that's in 6K looks more than 4K 60 crop. 4K 20, four frames per second, doesn't look like it has a crop. 4K 60 does look like it has a crop, very subtle crop. So it has a bunch of great features for video as well. But then it has a tilt screen, not an articulating screen, a tilt screen. Sure, it's nice for photos because you can tilt it if you're shooting landscapes, you can even tilt it down. And if you're shooting portraits, you can tilt it up like that. So it's great for photo, but in a world where everyone is going with articulating screens, with creators and content creators in mind, just doesn't make sense why they would go back to a tilt screen. And that's when I think I figured it out. It's a great hybrid camera for both photographers and videographers in mind, just not content creators who like to film themselves. Now, for those of you who don't know what film simulations are or film recipes are, think of them like picture profiles, except a hundred times better. The picture profiles mimic your favorite film stocks like Classic Chrome, Classic Negative, Astia, Provia. They also mimic the contrast and tones of these film simulations or film stocks. You can use these film simulations as a base for your film recipes. And they actually look really, really good and similar to the real film version. So good that yes, you don't have to edit your photos if you don't want to. You can shoot in JPEG and get great looking colors right out of camera. So I've taken this camera everywhere with me and have taken as much photos and tests that I could have done in a month's worth of time. Basically every time I went out to go shoot photos with the guys, I brought this camera out with me. So here are my honest thoughts about this camera. So the first thing I noticed with the X-T5 is the comfortability, but also the weight and size. It's a little bit smaller than my a7 IV. If I put it back to back, a tiny bit smaller than the a7 IV, but not by much. The difference is when you start putting these APS-C lenses on that are smaller than full frame lenses, that's when the whole system actually becomes smaller, compact and lighter. So I did really enjoy the weight of this camera. I am a huge fan of the photos, especially the raw files that come out of this camera. They're super easy to work with and the colors that come out of these raws are just amazing, especially when using my Ethereal preset pack. Basically all the photos that you've been seeing in this video have been edited with my Ethereal preset pack. And whether you shoot on Canon, Sony, Nikon, Fuji, Lumix, I've tested these presets with raw files from all of these systems. So I know that they'll work for you. When I'm editing my photos, I'm all about saving time. And I use my preset pack to do exactly that. So typically a photo takes me 10, 20, even 30 minutes to edit, but utilizing the presets, the built-in tools and my masking presets built into my Ethereal preset preset pack, I'm able to get that down to just a couple minutes. So if you want to save time editing your photos, go check out my preset pack link in the description. As for battery performance, Fuji only sent me one battery with this camera. And I'm not going to lie. Every time I took this camera out, I was worried that it was going to die out on me because I never leave the house with just one battery. However, spending an entire day, six hours shooting over 500 photos, it only drained the battery a quarter of the way. So I still had three quarters of the battery left. Mind you, I was turning the camera on and off every time we switched locations. I also love the look of this camera. I think the silver version of this camera looks better because I like the retro look, but I've always liked Fuji films for this retro look. I love all the manual dials. Having dials like this are game changing. It's nice to be able to see all of your settings and adjust them without having to go into the camera's menu system. So if I want to change my drive mode, it's actually this dial at the bottom underneath my ISO so I can switch from single shot to continuous high. If I want to switch from single shot focus to continuous focus or manual, it's a little button or switch right here. I don't have to go into the camera's menu. So having all of these settings on the camera itself is great if you get used to it. There were many times I got frustrated and annoyed to the point where I just froze not knowing what to do because there was so much settings and it's not the camera's fault or anything like that. It's because I'm so used to shooting on my Sony, which doesn't have all of this and only having the camera for 
a month doesn't give you enough time to learn everything. Okay, so I've been out all day testing out the Fujifilm X-T5, taking photos and videos in a bunch of different scenarios. Now we're out here taking some low light portraits and low light photos to see how good the X-T5 really is in low light situations. When it came to shooting in low light, the X-T5 didn't perform the best. Again, this is not the camera. This is because it is an APS-C. So even when shooting in the lower ISOs of this camera, like this shot here that was taken at 1000 ISO, you can see the noise and grain coming in to the photo, even at 1000, ISO, which is not that much. And this was really the only time that I thought to myself, I wish I was shooting these photos on my full frame because on my a7 IV, I know I can crank that up to 1600, 3200, even 12,800 ISO and still get a decent photo with not much noise and grain in low light situations. And you can see that on this photo here. Again, it is an APS-C issue because of its smaller sensor, but one thing to consider is that the X-T5 does have a 40 megapixel sensor, which doesn't help in lower light situations. Now, in this time that I've had this camera, I ran into one major issue, major issue, and that was autofocusing. This camera was having a really hard time detecting and tracking my subject. Like, I mean a really hard time. Even if my subject was still and we were shooting on a bright sunny day and they were the only person in the shot, I'm talking this camera would not focus on them. And it was really, really frustrating. There were many times where I had a specific shot in mind and then when I went to go shoot it, I just gave up because the autofocus was not allowing me to take that photo. So the autofocus isn't doing too well in low light for video. I'm going to switch to manual focus. <laughs> Just copying what Anthony's doing. So at first I thought that there was a problem with the camera. Then I also thought, well, maybe that's just how Fuji's autofocusing system is. And I'm so used to and spoiled with Sony's good autofocus that I'm coming to the Fuji and it's not going to be the best. But then I was shooting with my friend Taha who shoots on the X-T4 and he also has the X-H2S. He said that the X-T5 is known to have these autofocusing issues. So while I was considering sending back this camera way earlier than my loan period because of how bad the autofocusing was, what do you know? Fujifilm releases a firmware update last week, basically fixing all of the autofocusing issues. So I went online, downloaded the firmware update, and yeah, the autofocus works great, exactly how it should be. Maybe not as fast as my Sony, but better than before. And it's actually working. It tracks my subject fine, whether I'm in single or continuous mode. If my subject is in frame, it's going to lock on using the eye detection autofocus, and it's just working like it should. If you would have asked me if I recommend this camera before the firmware update, I would have said no, definitely stay away from the X-T5. But now that this firmware update fixed all these autofocusing issues, would I recommend this camera? If you're looking for a good camera that takes great photos, great videos, and you also wanna dabble with the film simulations that Fuji has to offer, I think the X-T5 is a great option. The camera just has a lot of great features. It is priced at 1700 USD. And if you compare this to the Sony a6700, which just came out, that's priced at 1400 USD for that extra $300, you get dual SD card slots, better video features, film simulations, 40 megapixel sensor, and so much more. If you're like me in the same situation who makes videos of themselves, I wouldn't recommend this camera. It doesn't have the flip articulating screen, the flip out screen. It has this tilt screen, which you can't see yourself when filming. So I definitely wouldn't recommend this camera. And lastly, if you're a photographer and you know you want a camera that performs well in low light, then I probably would just stay away from APS-C and I would go full frame. Overall, the camera is great and I love the photos that I'm getting out of it. With that being said, I gotta pack this up and send this back to him. So let me know which camera I should test out next. If you enjoyed this video or you found it helpful, make sure to hit that like button. It really helps the channel grow. Make sure to subscribe if you wanna see more content like this and I'll see you in the next one. Uh -huh. You just <laughs> your card. I need help again. Dude, I, I just How do you click play? I won't play. Go.